So thank you very much um, to the, uh, the DSH group for uh, an incredible presentation. Um, I, I, I truly believe I got to attend this year, I got to attend the Kentucky Derby for the first time in my life. Um, I also attended the, uh, the Belmont in New York, um, where Justify won the, uh, the Triple Crown. And I have to say to you that it is uh, incredible. Um, when I arrived in Kentucky on a commercial flight, on American, I, I, the first thing that, that hit me is as you were arriving, there were just all these corporate jets that were lined up on either side of the runway. And so uh, Secret Service met me that there and I was having a discussion with them and I said, man, how many jets do they have here? And they said they had 700 corporate jets um, at that event. And they said that there's a private air facility that was about two miles away that was also full. And then um, uh, the other, Lexington, which was about an hour and a half drive, they had an airport there that was also full. Um, and, and clearly when we went to Belmont in New York, um, I mean, every time I was moving around, it was another celebrity, another star um, that was there. So this is uh, the sport of kings. This brings um, uh, an attention of a clientele that has only been coming to St. Lucia in dribs and drabs. And I genuinely believe that this event and events to precede it are clearly going to put St. Lucia on a completely different level in the Caribbean. And I am I'm appealing to corporate St. Lucia um, to participate, um, to get involved. Uh, the government of St. Lucia has invested significantly in backing this project. Um, the, the DSH group and have also themselves invested uh, time, money, and expertise to make this happen. And we're certainly uh, looking forward to everybody's participation and not only making this a reality, because it is going to be a reality, but certainly in terms of exposing St. Lucia to a completely different level. Um, the element to this event, which I know that most people are not going to fully understand until it starts happening, is that the wagering is not only here in St. Lucia, but the wagering is international. So the, the races actually will be distributed through all of the gaming houses in the world on a regular basis. Um, so uh, your brand will not only be exposed here on the day of the event, but will be on a global basis. So the Tote Club, um, that's a big part of what they're helping in terms of creating that distribution on an international basis. And we're also looking forward to the development of a, of a media house facility permanently, which will be on the facility to be able to televise um, all of the races on a regular basis. So that's a, a big component of the revenue stream and the exposure that's going to be generated. So I, I know that everybody's busy and I, I want to be able to try to cover all bases and I try to take directions from my, uh, the chamber in terms of what um, issues we should try to be able to cover. Um, so I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. Um, certainly I will make myself available to any questions afterwards in, in case there's something I have not covered uh, sufficiently. So first of all, in terms of uh, where we are with developments in St. Lucia, and I'm just going to start at the northern end of the island and start going down. Um, I want to say that uh, when I've made these presentations previously, sometimes I get the expectation that everybody thinks that because we're saying them, um, that they're supposed to happen almost literally the next day. Um, the, the way that I certainly work is that the first thing we do is we have a vision of what we want to be able to achieve. And then the next thing is to talk about how do we get these things um, executed. And the execution is not just about the actual building of the facility, but the amount of planning that takes place. And sometimes I get the impression, um, maybe wrongfully on my part, that when we start talking about ideas, um, people believe that we're actually making a statement as to actually what it's going to be. Um, but what we've tried to do is that uh, to be very transparent in our thinking and our process. There's nothing that we're surprising solutions with or certainly surprising the business community with. So when we came into government and we did the assessment as to what the state of the country was, uh, there immediately were things that we had to be able to 
address. And some of those things were in our manifesto, and clearly some of those things became and moved up in terms of priority because when we got in, it's when we got the accurate information as to where, where, where things were. So let me just start from the northern end of the island, which is the Sandals project. Um, Sandals, as you know, have announced um, that they're proposing to build a 375 all suite hotel, which will be called Sandals La Source, which will be located in between Sandals Grand and um, the landings. Um, as you know, planning approval was given. The project was, we broke ground, and unfortunately, um, there is a, a dispute that's taking place with the landings property. Um, landings has actually taken the, DC, the, uh, the DCA um, to court, um, indicating that they questioned the process that was used um, to be able to give the planning approval. They're also uh, concerned um, with regards to the site of light as well as the site of, um, of view because the project entails a 10-story building in that location. Um, I want to say that the government is very satisfied with the process that was used. Um, there was a proper EIA done by a well-recognized professional who's been used um, many times. And I think that, hopefully I don't have to educate the members in this room, but certainly it's worth repeating how that planning process takes, particularly the EIA. The developer pays for the EIA study, but the person who is hired to do the EIA reports to the, the, the DCA. It's an important point to note, because the professional person that's hired is not on any obligation to do an EIA that in any way supports the development. Okay? The EI is done independently and looks at the laws of St. Lucia and creates the engagement. The decision by the government to allow a 10-story building is, is one that was based on what the evidence was put before us. As many of you know that that land is reclaimed land. And to uh, build the buildings on it, the closer you get to Pigeon Island or to Sandals Grand, the deeper that you would have to pile to be able to make the project work. So clearly, you cannot develop evenly over the, the development. So building closer to the landing site allows them to still have to pile, but less. And therefore, the space that you would have to pile is made even smaller by being able to go up in height. There used to be, many, many years ago, a general policy that we would not allow buildings to be taller than a coconut tree. Um, I think that hopefully we can be honest with ourselves that we've passed that policy a long time ago, including the landings. So as an example, and I certainly don't want it ever to be felt that I am comparing landings to sandals. That's not the role of the government. The government is there to support every single developer that comes into this country. So I'm only using as an example. When the landings was going to be built, they recognized that in order to be able to maintain the real estate value of the properties, that they could build a marina. And so that the, prop the land in the back could be almost as equal in value as the properties that are on the beach. So that's why when you go to landings, you'll see that the units are built facing the marina. But government was asked to make a very tough decision because in building the marina meant that we would have to cut the beach. And in cutting the beach, you would deny solutions the thoroughfare along that beach area. And the government of the day made a very pragmatic decision that when you weighed up the cost benefits and they looked at some of the things that the property could have done to facilitate people continuing to cross, that that was an initiative they supported. And similarly, we have to recognize that beach land is very expensive and limited in solution. And so therefore, if we want to maximize the economic output, the reality is that we're going to have to go up in height. Landings is already at five stories. 
Um, I think that uh, Harbor Club is at seven floors. So we're already seeing that we're moving up in that perspective. And I have to say to you, you know, while we may in St. Lucia consider 10 floors very high, um, a restaurant in the rest of the world, that's not extremely high. So the good news is we have a court system um, and the court date is later this month. I'm really hoping that we will get a very clear decision coming out. But Sandals has chosen to hold off on commencing that project until the, the, the court uh, date is settled. So um, we are on a, a hold pattern here um, for that development. And government, again, is not taking sides. And government is very um, happy that this matter will be dealt with in court so that nobody can believe that they are prejudiced in either way. So either Sandals or the landings. Um, the Rex property, as you saw, the main building has been demolished. Um, uh, it is true that there has been now a joint venture between um, the Rex company and Sunway. Um, we are currently waiting for a decision, which I'm hearing is going to be later this month, as to the exact brand and what's going to be built there. I wanted to be very clear that we have agreed in principle to renew the lease of that property, but on the condition that the property is built to be a four and a half or higher star product, as well as that there would be a significant EP component to that project. So my government would not support the development of an exclusive, um, all-inclusive property in that site simply because of um, what is surrounding in the area. Um, we also would not support the continuation of Papio um, in its current form. So we would want to see Papio be included in the redevelopment and that we would see a higher branded property to take place in that location. Um, recently, um, Invest St. Lucia has been able to complete a, a transaction with a Barbadian uh, company um, that are also with uh, other Caribbean entities to build, to buy the land at Shock, um, as, and they're proposing to develop a Hyatt Hotel, which would be 400 rooms in that location. My understanding is that is also going to be a mixed use and that there's going to be both an all-inclusive component as well as an EP component in that, in that development. Um, we're um, just by the shock bridge on the left hand side, opposite the Audi. Where the, I think it was going to call, was it going to be Port, Port, Saint, Port Saint Charles or Port Saint James was going to be. Um, so that pro project, I believe, is where we've now transferred the land. Um, they're currently submitting um, their plans into the DCA for um, full <laughs> approval. So that generally takes anywhere between three and four months. The good news is that site already had an EIA done, so it would be a matter of just updating that EIA. And so we're very excited about that project. We've also, um, Invest in Lucia has also signed uh, agreement with the GP Group to develop a Marriott Courtyard, um, which will be a conference hotel at Point Seraphim. So in the open space that we have, um, in addition to building additional yachting facilities, and that would be phase one of the project, and then phase two of the project would now to be incorporate the rest of Point Seraphin, in which we're looking to redevelop Point Seraphin, where there will be shops on the ground floor and office spaces upstairs. And so the idea is to get greater utilization of that prime piece of land, because we don't believe that um, dedicating it to the cruise industry by itself is ever going to be sufficient. So we're seeing the town of Castries about to grow, and we felt that creating that additional commercial space in that location would be able to help with that. Um, Margaret Monplazy is here. We've had a very good meetings with the distillery. My understanding is the distillery is very close to commencing construction on two things. One is the upgrading of their um, plant and also the development of a major tourism attraction. Um, I think that they're looking to spend around 15 million um, US dollars on that, 30 million US dollars 
on that site. So we're going to see an opportunity of increased production of the rums, as well as now a phenomenal attraction. And this is a, a successful or model that they have done successfully in Martinique. Um, the Sabacha project, um, as you know, in, uh, in Choiseul, which is going to be the Fairmont, um, the project really had grown immensely and, very, and also grown immensely in cost. And the developers decided to try to scale down on the project, but also to be able to purchase more land and to increase the real estate component to that project. So we're hoping that um, the new drawings will be completed and that we're hoping to get it started by March of next year. Um, I should say that the Marriott Courtyard is looking to commence uh, construction um, by February of next year. And the Hyatt has indicated they're looking at, is it the second half or the, first, the end of the first half of the year? Uh, the, in the second half of 2019. The uh, Invest Solution is at the preliminary stages of putting together a master plan um, to be located near Sandy Beach, but not on Sandy Beach. Okay, so the goal here is that when you come around the bottom of the airport, that we'll be looking to cut a new road that would go along the fence of the high of the runway, and that means that that new road would now become the entrance to View Fort. So that road would go all the way along the run runway and would go to by where um, Rennick and Company is, or where um, AAU is, and, and some of the other facilities. So it would come onto that courtyard piece there. So it means now that the um, concrete road that continues into town, that space that's in that area, which is around 40 acres of land. Um, the goal is to come up with a master plan design for a, a, a village, uh, a tourism village in that area, um, in which we would put in the infrastructure, the roads, the water, the electricity, zone it properly in terms of ordinances, um, and then be able to sell that now to um, solutions as well as hopefully regional people because the idea is to make it specifically for three-star and four-star properties along with restaurants, etc. The, the, the concrete road now will become a pedestrian road. And again, I want to repeat the statements that we have said repeatedly, that there is no intentions of building any hotels or any development along the beach. So the idea is all the developments would take place on the other side of the concrete road and it would allow the reefs to remain completely public. So we would add more public facilities in order that people can enjoy the space even more than they've had before. Um, we're also in very advanced stages. Um, the plans have now been submitted to the DCA and they're currently conducting their EIA at the property that we know as Honeymoon Beach. Um, that is being done by a group called Galaxy um, Galaxy currently are constructing a property in St. Kitts called Ramada. Um, the goal is there is to be using a brand called Zoetry and also Dreams, which is brands that are owned by a very large American firm called uh, AM Resorts. Um, so we know them in the industry as Apple, Apple Vacations. They um, have properties in the Dominican Republic, in Jamaica, in, and in Mexico. And I know that they've been very anxious to come in and compete against Sandals in this particular market. So Zoetry is a high-end um, uh, couples-only development, and the, um, as well as their brand called Dreams. Uh, the DSH project, we got a, an idea that the horse racing track is already underway. We're looking to um, do the first race in, in February. Uh, very soon after that, we're looking to commence the work on the village that you just saw. In fact, we're, we've just signed our fifth supplementary agreement, or about to sign the fifth supplementary agreement. And as we told everybody, the supplementary agreements um, are binding, but the fact is we keep renegotiating as we see developments come on in order to make sure that it's a win-win situation for, for everyone. Um, but that, that fifth agreement is allowing for the sale of the land in that 36 acres. Um, and then we will then start focusing on site C, which is the Il Parata site. As I said to you, we're very close to um, being able to get uh, approvals from Carnival on the final location. 
Um, and once we've done that, um, I think it's probably going to take another eight months for us to be able to finish the EIAs, um, as well as to be able to uh, raise the sufficient funds. So the developer has, has uh, raised half of the money so far for the development, and we're looking to be able to have a plan that we can sell to pros pr prospective investors um, that we're hoping to be able to get at least nine um, companies to come in in agreement to build some hotels on that location. So critical um, public projects that we're working on, let me start with um, the Hunara International Airport. So as you know that we have um, come to an agreement with the Taiwanese government who've agreed to lend us a hundred million US dollars um, to be able to do that project. Um, that money is being uh, paid for by the airport tax um, that will be assigned to them and that we are going to be using a Taiwanese construction company called OECC. Um, they're the same company that did the airport in St. Vincent and have also done airports and highways in Guatemala and major infrastructural projects in Haiti that's in this region but they're also the ones that are involved in the major expansion of the airport in uh, Taipei. Um, I think that the Taipei airport is going to be able to now cope with something like five million passengers a year. So we're very excited about that. In fact, we're going to be going to Parliament very soon to be able to get Parliament's approval to be able to take on that loan. In addition to um, the hundred million, we're also borrowing another fifty million from Taiwan. Um, that will be done through the Ministry of Infrastructure, but again, the implementation of the projects will be done by OECC, um, who will be then overseeing the subcontracts locally, uh, and that is to spend 50 million US dollars on a major road rehabilitation throughout St. Lucia. Um, in addition to the 50 million US, the gasoline tax has been collecting approximately 30 million EC dollars a year, and so that money is also going to be used over the first five years in order to complement that spending. So the money, the first $14 million we collected last year has been used primarily to do some potholing around the country as well as the refurbishment of some projects, of some roads. So all in all, we're looking to spend around 300 million EC dollars in the next three years on major road redevelopments in St. Lucia. I do not envisage that any of that money will be spent on new roads. That is intended to be spent on upgrading the existing roads. And as large of a sum as that may sound, um, that's still not going to come close to doing all the roads in St. Lucia. Um, so uh, I hope everybody will recognize that we're doing what we can as fast as we can. And I know the Ministry of Infrastructure has been upgrading itself to be able to implement those projects. We're also going to be um, doing other roads that are being financed by the Japanese, which is the cul-de-sac bridge. In fact, it originally had included um, the Ravine Poisson Bridge as well as the cul-de-sac bridge. The bid that was done recently, um, the uh, estimates were much higher than what they were expecting. So we've agreed to take out the Ravine Poisson Bridge and we will finance that through a different mechanism and focus the funds, which is the $40 million that the Japanese are bringing, to be able to um, commence that project. Um, my understanding in speaking to the ambassador of Japan today is that we're hoping that by February that that will be completed and that we can commence works pretty soon afterwards. We also have a, a, low, a grant that was approved by the DFID funds, which is the UK funds. Um, and we're using it for the West Coast Road. I have to say that I'm personally very disappointed as to how long it's taking to be able to implement that project, but every step of the way has to go through a bidding process. Um, uh, the British government has agreed to send over DFID and a key minister here to meet with me in the hopes that we can see if we can get this thing expedited. Um, these funds have been available to the Eastern Caribbean since David Cameron gave them to us. And not only have we not spent them here, but they've not been spent anywhere else in the Caribbean. And so 
I think this is, when you hear me uh, agitating and um, uh, advocating for a change in policy with regards to the development agencies, this is exactly what we're talking about. We don't think that this is an overly complicated project, and we think that we recognize the need for good governance, but when good governance starts getting in the way of progress, we think that something has to be able to change in that regard. Um, in terms of the healthcare sector, um, this has been a very, very challenging space. Um, when we came in, um, we had expected and understood or made the assumption that the reason the former government had not moved into OKEU was because they could not afford to do so. Um, and I want to say to you that we were right. So the estimates that have been provided to us through the University of West Indies and that have been collaborated by a private entity is that it would cost us around $70 million to operate OKEU as a replacement to Victoria Hospital. Right? And Victoria Hospital costs about $30 million. So it means that if you make the assumption that you're going to completely shut down Victoria, and move all of the services into OKEU, you would still have to come up with an additional $40 million in expenses. That does not also take into consideration that it is a quantum leap in technology that we're proposing to do going from Victoria to OKEU. And who is going to run that and the equipment is a very critical um, assumption that we have to figure out. Because the worst thing to do is when you have new electronic equipment and you try to experiment with it, it means that the period of free uh, maintenance that you would normally get on brand new equipment could post possibly be uh, short-lived. And it means that the $70 million would be even higher. The next problem that we've had is that in moving into OKEU, it's only 120 beds compared to 170 beds at Victoria. So there's no way that we believe that we can completely shut down Victoria um, and open up OKEU. So it means that the cost, incremental cost to the government to St. Lucia is even higher. The proposal that we found on the table, um, which was represented to us when we came into government, was to increase the NIC, current NIC contribution, which is 10%, 5% by the, the businesses and 5% by the individuals, to have increased that to 15%. So it means that government, your company's contribution would be 7.5% and the individual's contribution would be 7.5%. So it's a 50% increase in the current contribution. That would generate approximately $50 million a year. So the assumption was that we could use that money to be able to cover this additional cost. My government, after reviewing that, was discomforted in the fact that I would be taxing people, but other than moving into a new facility, there would really be no added new services. So the people who could not afford health care prior to that certainly would not be in a position to afford health care afterwards. And that's why my government has made the very deliberate policy decision to introduce health care insurance. So we're going to introduce a national health care insurance program. So we have successfully been able to negotiate a very friendly loan from the World Bank of 20 million U.S. dollars. Um, 15 million dollars of that U.S. is going to be supporting the strengthening of our primary health care facilities. Um, and we are also spending money specifically on the consultancies to be able to introduce the health care insurance, to come up with the structures, to have the um, integration or the, the, the dialogue so that we're all on the same page to be able to move forward. Um, it is the, the goal of my government to be able to try to have this new health care insurance um, start at the end of 2019, first quarter 2020, certainly before the budget process starts, the budget cycle begins in uh, 2020. It's an ambitious timeline, but 
We genuinely believe this is one that we can accomplish because insurance is not new to St. Lucia. So um, we have people who have health care insurance. Um, the companies that have been providing that health care insurance have a tremendous amount of experience, but certainly it's to make sure that we introduce a system that we believe that's going to be fair and workable to everyone. And again, for further clarity, the plan that we're looking at means that businesses and individuals who are working would make their contribution, um, and government would take on the responsibility of providing the insurance for the unemployed and the more vulnerable people in our society. So when we say 100% coverage, we generally mean 100% um, coverage. As you would have heard, we've been working on upgrading the primary health services, because if you read the plans for OKEU, it was always, always the assumption that we would have beefed up the primary health care services. So that means that um, the demand that's being put on uh, Victoria would be now spread more evenly around the country. So when we came in, while that was written on paper, there were absolutely no resources allocated to it, and the work had not begun on any of, the, of, those, resource, of, those, of those primary health care services. We've just completed three, um, and as I said, the 15 million US dollars that we're going to be using is to continue that process and to put more equipment in it. We are um, working with an organization called UNOPS um, that have been doing three major projects for us. Um, one is to develop a new development control authority. So basically to take the DCA out of the government and make it a statutory body. So that means the Ministry of Planning will be responsible for policy um, and the DCA would be the regulatory agency. Um, this is something that had been envisioned a long time ago, um, but they're now helping us to put the structure in place and to make that transition happen. And it's expected that that's going to take place, if I'm not mistaken, Nancy, within the next six months, um, that that's going to take place. Um, they're also working on a project to develop a, a unit called NIP. Um, NIP's responsibility is to do a full inventory of all of government's assets, bridges, roads, buildings, everything, and then assist us in putting together a master plan for the growth of the country. So that means that when we go to the Ministry of Health on a budgetary period, we're actually telling them how many new schools and where we think the locations need to be. They would then evaluate it, cost it, and implement it. But we're going to now re-centralize the, uh, the planning, physical planning of our, of our country. And the third thing that they're working on, which I'm very excited about, as you remember, Sir John, um, before he passed away, um, unveiled what we, what we call the Quadrant Economic Plan or the Vision Plan for St. Lucia. And there was a tremendous amount of detailed work that was done, particularly on the cast trees redevelopment. So the um, UNOPS is assisting us in bringing urban planners in and engineers to now make that project shovel ready. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there have been several stakeholder meetings already. Um, and dialogue is taking place, and we're expected to be able to get a presentation within the next 30 days from them um, as to their initial findings. And this is certainly going to be the roadmap for us in terms of implementing the redevelopment of cast trees. Uh, clearly, we would hopefully appreciate the reality. The fact is, is that since the fire in 1945, um, and the building of temporary buildings in 1951, many of those buildings are still standing. And we think that many of those buildings are structurally unsound. Um, many of them are remaining empty at this point, um, and that we're not getting the proper utilization of that land in, some, in cast trees. So we are uh, in the process of completing the, the purchase of Mount Hope, Mount Pleasant, sorry, which is 17 acres of land, and putting together a plan for residential as well as some commercial facilities up there, um, with the idea of redeveloping parts of the CDC area, um, the main boulevard where the Printry, um, the Parliament Building, and the Courthouse are, um, as well as the Castries Basin. 
Um, to complement that study, um, we have engaged um, Ballas Needham. Ballas Needham are the Dutch company that did the, um, the redevelopment of the Point Seraphin berth. Um, and they are actually doing a feasibility for us as to uh, port cast trees and the container port and, and looking at the cul-de-sac options. So rather than just talk about it, we're actually putting together a feasibility in terms of how we can potentially make that happen. Um, the report will, a draft report will be given to us in January um, and we're hoping to get the concluding report from them on February. Um, the government has already been in dialogues with several potential partners on the uh, uh, Castries port, both from a cruise ship perspective as well as from a container perspective. And we've got those um, agreements pending, holding, until we get this, this final, final plan to be able to move forward. In terms of uh, implementation of programs, we continue to be um, concerned at the pace in which government can implement projects. Um, and so we have uh, with us, uh, I think that they're here, if I can ask them to stand up, uh, people from Pyramandu, are they here? Uh, two of them uh, that are here. One is doing tourism, another one's doing infrastructure. We're also doing agriculture, we're doing health, we're doing education and social development. So there are six critical areas that we're looking at. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Pyramandu was a successful program that was implemented in Malaysia in terms of helping them implement um, major government projects and, and, and critical infrastructural projects. It is also being supported by a unit that's called the um, delivery unit, which you may or may not remember was something that um, uh, former Prime Minister Blair had started, and they're based out of England. Um, I hopefully many of you in this room have been invited to participate in some of the sessions. Um, so the goal is that we'll be meeting on a regular basis for the next three weeks um, with an idea of getting a roadmap uh, on the way forward, if I'm not mistaken, early part of December, and that the, these will now be incorporated into the budget that we're currently doing. So I've stated to you, my government is open to being criticized. Um, we want to do the right thing. We are dedicated to being transparent. Um, I have to say to you, it's not always easy. Um, so many times, words are taken out of context. The media, I'm not saying the mainstream media, but people are editing what they want to edit and what I say, or that my ministers say, um, which makes the matters even more confusing, and hence the continual pressure on me that we need to improve our public relations. But uh, we are being transparent. There is no project, there's no developer that we are engaging that the public of St. Lucia doesn't know about. And we certainly take our time to go through the due process. There's no project that I certainly know of that the government has commenced without planning approval, without doing things on a, on a, a legally correct way and following the procedures and the laws of St. Lucia. Uh, finally, I want to say to you that from a state of the economy, tourism continues to do very well. Um, we did see a hit in September and October. I have to say to you that that was what we had expected because of the hurricane season last year. The moment the first hurricane in the region arose, booking stopped. And that was not just for St. Lucia, but it, an entire Caribbean trend. And normally these things take three years to overcome. So it would take three years of no hurricanes to hit that it then becomes forgotten and we get back on pace. But I can say to you that I know the Ministry of Tourism and the SLHT are working collaboratively together to try to see what we can do to continue to do that. But I have to say to you that we've had an excellent year so far. Advanced bookings are extremely strong, um, particularly with having an English test match in February, um, as well as uh, some games in March. And with the 40th anniversary of our independence, um, we have seen uh, a banner um, winter season coming up. In terms of taxes, because I certainly have not received a lot of economic numbers, so I have to go by numbers that I can, I can, I can sense. So gas consumption, importation of containers, um, electricity consumption, 
Um, all these numbers are up considerably. Um, we are very happy with the pace of both corporate and personal income tax, and also the pace that we're seeing in VAT. So all these things are very strong indicators that there is a substantial amount of turnover taking place in the economy. We've already seen that with the reduction of the VAT rate of 12.5%, we're currently collecting slightly more money than we were collecting when we were at 15%. So mathematically, that just tells you that the turnover in the economy is absolutely there. The last thing that probably is of most interest to all of you is with regards to the blacklist with uh, Europe. Um, we are been working very closely with that offshore sector, um, and I want to publicly thank um, the Ministry of Finance and uh, particularly uh, Ms. Sophia Henry, um, who heads up IRD and her team, um, Ms. Spooner, for the incredible work that they've been doing in working with the EU. Um, we have uh, received approvals in principle um, in terms of the structure that we've been proposing. We are waiting for the uh, formal approvals. Um, it is our intention to be going to Parliament on November 20th to make amendments to uh, many of our tax laws in order for us to be compliant with the new requirements. I believe that we've been able to work out a mechanism that preserves for the most part, um, our financial service sector and has not cost us a lot in revenue loss. So uh, I'm very encouraged by what I have seen. I also want to say to you that we've seen a huge boom in the IT sector. We've seen almost 2,000 new jobs being created in that sector. Um, uh, KM2 have hired additional 400 people. There's a company in uh, the Johnson's building, which is about to start with 400 people. Um, there is another company that's a local gentleman in the Alfiona building um, that has about 300 to 400 people. Um, and the Ojo Labs is at 230, um, and it is expected they will be to 700 people by the end of next year. Um, we believe that this industry is going to continue to grow particularly as you see the unemployment rate in the United States of America dropping, and there was a 3.7% increase in cost of salaries in the United States of America. And so it means that the, the cost benefit of these call centers, which are the back of the house operations, that they're, they're making significant impact. Um, we've seen, we have three, four major international companies um, that are currently in dialogue. Um, with the possibility of adding between the four of them over 2,000 new jobs in this sector. Um, the government will continue to do what we did with Ojo in terms of converting what used to be manufacturing shells into these IT center cell shells. The government was also successful in getting Monroe College to open up a facility in Viewfort. Um, we are using what used to be the, uh, the NICE program funds so instead of employing full-time people at $1,500 a month on a contract, what we've been doing is using $500 to complement um, the salaries of the people at Ojo for the first year and a half, only on their new employees. Um, and we're also using $500 a month to support um, the young people so they can pay for their bus transportation and meals to be able to attend the new Monroe Hospitality Program in the south. So we had 150 kids who are currently under training. We have another 150 about to start in January. I'm also very excited because when I was at the FCCA conference, both Carnival Cruise Lines and also MSC um, have agreed to send teams down here to work with Monroe um, to be able to hire as many of the kids they possibly can because they have 22 new ships coming on stream and they're in dire need of more staff. Um, I believe uh, one of them has actually offered that once the kids work for two contract periods on the ship, they will pay off the loan to the students. So um, the, the loan that we're providing, which is through the St. Lucia Development Bank, um, is for the tuition, it's for the airfare to go to Barbados, it's for the visa application and the medical. Um, most of the ships normally refund 
the uh, application process for the visas when the kids get on the boat. But the fact is that these are very reasonable loans. Um, we are getting the kids to sign documents beforehand that uh, says that they are willing to their, get their employer to make the deduction um, from the, the, their salaries and the ships have agreed to facilitate that. So the idea is that we reduce the risk that we have with um, SLDB. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, I hope I've not given you too much um, or maybe that I've uh, not, maybe not given you enough. Um, but I, I want to say that my government is extremely pleased with where we are today. Um, would we have liked to have seen more things have started because some of those projects were supposed to have started um, this fall? Unfortunately, things that are outside of my control and that you have to go through the due process um, got in their way. But we are continue on course. I'm very encouraged. Um, and uh, I think the amount of money that is about to start flowing into this economy and the investment that we're going to be making into the infrastructure of this company. I have not even told you about the $90 million that we're spending on the dam. We're spending another $70 million in grace on, on the expansion of the intake down there to 4.5 million gallons, if I'm not mistaken, per day. We're also expanding the water output in the Chumasse area from 500,000 to 150,000. To one, so to, from 500,000 to one and a half million. We have the second phase of the Denry project, which is to pipe the water to everybody's homes, which is about nine million US dollars. So there is a lot of work taking place on the ground um, and we're moving. So the last project, which is the one that's probably the dearest to everybody's heart, um, which is the, the St. Jude's Hospital. I wanna say to you that um, uh, my government inherited an absolute mess. Um, it's, it's, it's shameful as what has taken place at St. Jude's and that um, a government would have spent five years and spent over hundred and thirty six million dollars uh, to build a building and that the building is not open and in fact it's, it's about 50 percent completed. It certainly does not meet, meet, meet code um, and to put that in perspective, the OKEU hospital that you see cost $168 million, finished, fully equipped. And we've spent 138 at St. Jude's, and we're not even close to being finished. Um, it, it took us uh, a good nine months to do the analysis, to look at all the different options. And we went from finishing it to doing a partial opening um, looking at what our alternatives are, um, but I, I'm very happy to report because I think the Minister of Economic Development, Development has said this, so I'm not saying anything out of school. Um, we have been able to secure the financing to build a new wing at St. Jude's. We believe that that's the best option that we have, that we can actually build a facility cheaper and faster by just building a new wing at that facility and certainly being able to meet the expansion um, of Viewport, that a medium term to long term solution for Viewport that would be of international standards. Um, we're looking to finish the dialysis center right away. Um, the Taiwanese had lent $20 million, which 10 had already been spent. So we're, we've gotten commitments to get the 10 million to start the project now. And we'd be able to negotiate with the Taiwanese an additional loan of 20 million to make it 30 million dollars um, to be able to do that. And we're looking at the construction to be done by OECC um, because it's with them. Depending on if, because we have some other options where we may have some PPPs coming up, but right now it is to do it with the Taiwanese and the OECC. Um, they're already here doing the airport project and was overseeing the road, so we think that they more than have the capacity to be able to handle the oversight of that, of that project. The designs for the project has been completed, the engineering drawings have been completed or about to be completed, and they're being submitted and we're working with the DS, DSA with them. So the idea is to be getting DCA approval on the different steps as we proceed. So we're moving as fast as we possibly can to rectify that situation. Um, we know the challenges that exist 
at the stadium. Um, and we're working with the staff as best as possible to make them as comfortable as possible. But we recognize and understand the frustration by both the people who are working there as well as um, the citizens who have to depend on it. Many of them come from my own constituency, so I, I get the pressure every time that I go down. Uh, but the fact is, is that uh, we have to do this thing the right way. And I can assure you and assure all the solutions that you'll be very proud of the development. So I I'm comfortable that once you have all the financing and you have the design completed, and you have a great company doing the implementation, that we should not see a repeat of what happened the last five years. So again, I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for the support. Um, and I'm looking forward to a phenomenal uh, 2019 as we continue to build a new solution. Thank you.